Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Ross McKeechee and I'm so happy to welcome you to this special event in collaboration with Word Festival Vancouver and Banyan Books and Sound. I'm the host of the Banyan Books podcast, which is called Branches of Wisdom. Okay, our very special guest today, I'm so excited to introduce her. Her name is Naomi Shihab Nye. She's a Palestinian American poet, editor, songwriter, and novelist. She's a graduate of Trinity University and is the recipient of numerous honors and awards for her work. And from 2019 to 2022, She was the Young People's Poet Laureate for the United States Poetry Foundation. She has received the Ivan Sandroff Award for Lifetime Achievement from the National Book Critics Circle and the Lon Tinkle Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Texas Institute of Letters, along with many, many other awards. She has served as a chancellor for the Academy of American Poets, as well as a national council member for the National Endowment for the Humanities. She was poetry editor for the New York Times Magazine from 2019 to 2020. Nye is author and or editor of more than 30 volumes, including Everything Comes Next, Collected and New Poems, Castaway, Poems for Our Time, 19 Varieties of Gazelle, Poems of the Middle East, Amaze Me, Poems for Girls, Words Under the Words, Fuel, and You and Yours, which was a best-selling poetry book of 2006. Her middle grade novel, The Turtle of Oman, was chosen as both a best book of 2014 by the Horn Book and a 2015 notable children's book by the American Library Association. And its standalone companion, The Turtle of Michigan, was just published. Today, Naomi Shihab Nye joins us for a conversation on her life and work along with readings from her book published in 2018, which is titled Voices in the Air, Poems for Listeners. In Voices in the Air, a collection of over 100 poems, Naomi reflects on those who influence us, bring us joy, and most importantly, inspire us. In her own words, I think the air is full of voices. If we slow down and practice listening, we hear those voices better. They live on in us. Inspiration, we need it every day. We deserve it. It is essential like food, water, clean air, shelter. Here are some poems celebrating the voices that have changed my life and continue to do so. If you'd like to learn about more about Naomi Shihab Nye or follow her on social media, you can find her on Instagram. You can learn more about her from the Poetry Foundation website, from the Stephen Barclay Agency and from Harper Collins. So everybody, please join me in a very warm welcome for our guest today, Naomi Shihab Nye. Hello, Ross. Thank you for that very gracious, beautiful introduction. So generous. It's such an honor to be here with Banyan Books and Word Vancouver. I am a lover of Canada uh, from my childhood. Uh, My best friend in second grade was from Quebec, and I spent two summers living in Nova Scotia and then traveling around Canada and uh, have come to Vancouver 
uh, more than once for wonderful projects. And I just thank you so much uh, for welcoming me. Thanks to Dr. Bonnie Nish and also uh, to Dave Seaweed. I was very moved by that, uh, the statement, the indigenous people's statement. And as a half Palestinian, I know how important that is that people are acknowledged in the places where they were and are. And uh, living here in South Texas for so long, I also know that I have many, many people to acknowledge who lived on this land uh, before us, the Payaya, the Karankawa, the Kickapoo, the Comanche, and so many indigenous peoples from Mexico. Uh, this is a mysterious, beautiful uh, region of great depth. And I welcome you all to come here. I live in San Antonio in the old downtown where a river runs for 15 miles and you can walk along the river without ever coming up to the street level, which is quite a pleasure. That sounds beautiful. Yeah. Maybe we could start with having you share share one of your pieces from Voices in the Air with us. And I the, the poem early in the book on page 18 called Bundle seems like a good place to start. Sure, thank you, Ross. Why didn't you take a photograph out the window of every place you ever stayed? Clotheslines, balconies, food vendors could have focused on any one thing. But I was lingering at the dock, fascinated by a seagull with a hopping gait, catching the breeze, scrap of pink ribbon, yellow shovel half buried in sand, or a picture of every classroom you inhabited even for an hour. The boy who said, I'm afraid I'm in love with the word lyrical. On a hundred degree day, pencil swooping across page. He looked like the toughest customer in town till he said that. To wake with a word, bundle, tucked between lips and wonder all day what it means, bundle of joys, troubles, each day the single mystery word could change, veil, forget, abandon. And consider the people at any crossing walk, how you will never cross with them again. Isn't that enough to make a charm? Or the careful ways we arrange a desk wherever we are, temporary landscape, pencils, sharpener, drifting moon of a cup over everything, silent and humble, bearing its own hope. Thank you, Ross. I've never read that word out loud before, but since I've had such a bundle of excitement um, <laughs> thinking of being with you today, I appreciate your letting me read it. Thank you. It's such a beautiful poem. And the, I, I love the opening line. Why didn't you take a photograph out the window of every place you ever stayed? Yeah. Um, actually, that was spoken to me by a very close college friend on the telephone. And it would turn out to be the last conversation. He was calling me, you know, after I hadn't seen him in years. And because I travel so much in my life before COVID, uh, he just said that during the conversation. And I thought, what an incredible idea. I copied it down. Maybe I should attribute it to him. But it turned out to be the last conversation we ever had. He died suddenly afterwards. And so that line um, kept drifting in the air, you know, thinking of him. And what a great idea that is. You know, I think of the window from my room on Granville Island in Vancouver. I can just conjure up that view. But there are so many I've forgotten that weren't quite as memorable as that one. And uh, it would be great to be able to shuffle through now and, and see all the places one went in a lifetime. Of course, we didn't have iPhones when I was growing up or, or little hand devices that allowed us to take photo, photographs so easily. So it would have been a mixture of, of uh, elements. Yeah. Now this book, Voices in the Air, this, this you mentioned that the first line of the poem you just read, Bundle, was the words that came out of the lips of a friend of yours. And the, the concept of this book is stories about people that some of them you've met, some not. 
And I'm just wondering if you can you can fill in our audience on the, a bit on the concept of Voices in the Air and how that came to you. Well, thank you. Um, way back in elementary school, uh, I remember a science teacher or someone talking about echo and reverberation and how when some when a sound is made on planet Earth, it goes out into the atmosphere and lingers there and in fact resides there forever. And uh, and I believe, I think it was Abraham Lincoln that this teacher was quoting, um, who isn't known for being a scientist particularly, but that he had said that in some famous speech he gave, you know, all the voices that informed history were still out there in the atmosphere. And I was, I remember being so fascinated by that concept uh, that I couldn't even pay a bit of attention the rest of the day in school, just thinking about it. Who are the voices you would like to hear? Uh, but then, you know, you can carry that thought further that in your own memory, you contain the voices of your teachers, of your best friends from childhood, of people who have died before you, um, you know, family members, but then also carry it further to the family members you never met, whom you only heard about through hearsay. And, you know, as writers, of course, we're uh, we're always fascinated by, by language and how it surrounds us. How could anyone be lonely when there's so much around us? You know, many of us live in rooms of books and we carry books wherever we go. And so that, that sense of, of having uh, voices in our hands, in our memories, um, is, is part of our endurance. It's part of our courage. Um, you know, we don't get our, our thoughts, our ideas out of a vacuum. I'm always telling this to kids, you know, you don't have to have a great idea when you start writing. Just ask yourself, what's something you've heard lately that stayed with you floating? Um, what's something you heard a long time ago that never left you? And maybe it was something you didn't even agree with. Maybe it was something you were curious about and, uh, had a different thought about whatever it is, go back to that, pick that up, let that be a thread. So, you know, as writers, we have so many other fa favorite writers and it was fun to uh, carry my thread through this book of voices we all listen to, or many of us listen to. And I used, you know, my bevy of favorites, William Stafford, Peter Matheson, Grace Paley, Maya Angelou, just people whose voices had been with me forever um, and then you know hoped that anyone who read the book might think well who are mine who are my voices what could I say that they said and then where would I carry that um, you just mentioned William Stafford I understand is it true that he was a uh, one of your mentors I would say he was the main one Mm -hmm. uh, from the age of about 16, 17, when um, my family had moved to Texas at that point, and uh, his, his three of his poems were contained in the English textbook, the high school textbook my school was using. And I remember distractedly leafing ahead in the book from whatever poet we were talking about at that moment or piece of literature and finding William Stafford and just being transfixed by every line of every poem and uh, feeling, the feeling I remember having was I could see through the wall. Suddenly there was a voice out there. I'd never heard of him before, but I wanted to be with that voice. I wanted to go find more. And so I ran to the high school library and they had three of his books. It was miraculous. So I checked them all out and, and then ran to the public library after reading those. And he was such a prolific poet that you know, there was always more and more to read of William Stafford. And, uh, and now for anyone who hasn't read him, um, there's a whole digital archive from Lewis and Clark College that you can go to through their library site and read anything you like, even things which were not published during his lifetime. And I would urge everyone to, because I really think he was one of the most comforting poets of the 20th century. One of the most inspiring, um, ba well-balanced, very, very humorous in his own subtle way, uh, an incredibly observant 
spirit of a poet. Uh, so I'll say his name again, William Stafford. I could never say enough about his work and, and I never tire of reading his poems. Um, they will give you something new every time. Would you be willing to read for us your poem, which was dedicated to William Stafford on page 80 called Woven by Air, Texture of Air? Yes, thank you. It has a quote from William Stafford at the top. Your job is to find out what the world is trying to be. Some birds hide in leaves so effectively, you don't see they're all around you. Brown tilted heads, observing human maneuvers on a sidewalk. Was that a crumb someone threw? Picking and poking, no fanfare for company. Gray huddle on a branch, blending in. Attention deeper than a whole day. Who says, I'll be a thoughtful bird when I grow up. Stay humble, blend, belong to all directions. Fly low, love a shadow, and sing, sing freely. Never let anything get in the way of your singing. Not darkness, not winter, not the cries of flashier birds, not the silence that finds you steadfast pen ready at the edge of 4 a.m. Your day is so wide, it will outlive everyone. It has no roof, no sides. I, I would also urge your kind listeners to um, follow Kim Stafford, uh, William Stafford's son on Instagram, because he posts a poem uh, almost every single day. He's also a marvelous essayist, memoirist, a great teacher, probably one of the greatest teachers I've ever known. And um, give yourself that gift. You can have, have Kim's voice popping into your box regularly. And um, I really admire his sense of service around a poetry, which, which definitely um, echoes his father's and, and his mother's, who was a great, great human being and educator herself. That's wonderful. Okay, Kim Stafford, I'm definitely going to check him out. Uh, I want to come back to one of the lines you wrote here, and it leads to a question. Um, stay humble, blend, belong to all directions, fly low, love a shadow, and sing, sing freely. Never let anything get in the way of your singing. And it mm -hmm. goes on. But th that is so beautiful to me, and it makes me think about the process of listening in poetry and staying low, not, you know, to, to observe and, and, and to notice. Mm -hmm. And I know that I was reading up on William Stafford. I know that he had this practice of getting up early in the yes. morning and writing every morning. Yes. I'm curious, what is your practice and process around writing? Do you have a structure or is it more spontaneous? Well, no, I've, I've always gotten up early in the morning and I've written myself since I was a teenager. And uh, even before I knew that William Stafford did that, I was just an early riser because it felt uh, that you could have like a good 30 minutes or hour before you had to do other things, you know, get ready to go to school. And and there would be kind of a better better sense of gravity in your spirit if you'd taken a little quiet time uh, with your page, sort of like a morning meditation with a page, an interactive meditation. And William Stafford used to say, uh, an artist is someone who lets the page talk back. And so you would have that time where you're not only putting down a thought you're carrying, possibly from a dream if you've just gotten up, but also you're listening to what else might be coming through you or to you early in the day. That always seemed like the freshest time of day to me before you, you know, talk to anyone else or hear anything else. Um, and William Stafford talked more about that in his books of essays. He wrote about four books of essays um, called different writing the Australian crawl. You must revise your life um, walking across unmarked or crossing unmarked snow was the name of one of them. And that's what the page is like. Um, that crossing of a new space and listening. I, I just found it helped me in my life, Ross. And even, you know, when I was 
the grown up and going to work or raising a, a son, um, you know, all the things we'll be called upon to do in any given day. And yes, I know everyone has a lot to do. Um, if you take a little time for yourself, a little envelope of that quiet time, uh, doesn't have to be an hour, could be 10 minutes. Uh, I just think you'll feel better about things. And there will be more of an interaction with you and your thinking and the words being given to you um, on any given day. It, it's really quite, it, it's quite available to us. All we have to do is get in a little bit of a ritualistic habit. And, you know, I think these COVID years of more isolation for many people, um, some of my students that I have now say it, it made them feel like they're mo more OCD now, like they need to have their rituals. They need things to be kind of precise. And, and I feel the same way because we did have a little bit more time at our homes and maybe still do. So you were able to set aside, okay, in this space, I'm gonna do such and such, in this space, such and such. Um, but also about those lines, stay low, don't, don't ever let anything get in the way of your singing. Um, simply during the past two weeks, I've heard from a number of really wonderful voices, uh, writers, wonderful writers, both young and older, that something has gotten in the way of their own singing, whether it was reading a bad review someone did of their work or someone responding not in the way they would have hoped to something they had written. And, you know, I think we'll all be challenged in this way at some time or another. And so we have to maintain a very kind of basic conviction that it's okay. You know, that will happen. Not everyone will love what I do. That doesn't matter. Um, as an older person, I've started saying, who cares? You know, so you got a bad review, who cares? You know, just let it go. Why, why are you giving it power over you? Um, don't let it stop you up from your voice uh, being able to emerge. That's wonderful. That's so wonderful. I, and it seems like to me a, a good segue into your poem titled To Manage, which is on page one. Yeah, that's the first poem in the book. Thank you. And I do urge students, if they're having trouble getting started on a piece of writing, well, just look at some messages in your inbox, most people have those these days, that you haven't answered yet. And pick one out, um, even randomly if you like, and answer it in the shape of a poem. You know, give a vertical answer where you stack your lines and uh, just see if you can kind of restart yourself uh, back with your writing by, by doing that, just speaking in the shape of a poem to someone who's written to you. It's kind of fun to do. I mean, really, you could do it with all your email if you if you choose. So I was writing back to a student uh, I didn't really know personally, but she had been in, a, in an audience at a school I had just visited. And uh, the first two sentences of this piece are from her email, and then the rest I kind of dreamed up. And I wrote it back to her as, as it stands here. She writes to me, I can't sleep because I'm 17. Sometimes I lie awake thinking, I didn't even clean my room yet. And then I wrote, and soon I will be 25 and a failure. And when I am 50, oh, I write her back slowly, slow, clean one drawer, arrange words on a page. Let them find one another, find you. Trust they might know something. You aren't living the whole thing at once. That's what a minute said to an hour. Without me, you are nothing. Um, and sometimes, of course, you'll find out you're also writing to yourself when you do that. You know, and. Um, she did write me something back like, well, that's funny. Um, I like that. Or thanks for responding. And, um, you know, I hope that's she wonderful. wasn't insulted <laughs> about the failure. You know, like, <laughs> you know, we don't work everything out at any given age. As a poet, you value 
the pause, the mm. simple, the small things. When I was reading your profile on the Poetry Foundation website, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I read something. It said that you told uh, contemporary authors, and this is a quote, you said, I have always loved the gaps, the spaces between things as much as the things. I love staring, pondering, mulling, puttering. I love the times when someone or something is late. There's that rich possibility of noticing more in the meantime. Poetry calls us to pause. There's so much we overlook while the abundance around us continues to shimmer on its own. That sounds even better in your voice, Ross. You have such, <laughs> a, good, such a good voice. I'm sure anything sounds better in your voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for saying it. I, I do you, like all that, yeah. Yeah, can you comment on, on the practice of pausing and yeah, noticing the small yeah. things for aspiring poets? Sure. Well, you know, we're very hard on ourselves as critics. And uh, sometimes we just need to um, take a walk, um, go out, sit on a step, look at a tree that we think we know very well, but I'll bet you can find something different about it if you stare at it for a longer minute. Um, you know, not not be so inward about our resistances to things we might want to do. And um, I'm, I'm very uh, anti that sense of uh, overscheduling one's days, you know, like where you make a to do list and, and there's no blank spaces in it, or like scheduling a child for the entire summer without giving them big blocks of time in which just to play, do anything, get dirty, get messy, dig a hole. But, um, you know, we've become very, very determined in our modern world to like use our time wisely. And um, I have friends who have set up their phones and iPads or whatever they carry around to actually ding at certain moments. Like, okay, now it's time for you to do this other thing. And I think that's so scary. Um, I, I, I do like discipline and I do like being early versus, you know, I never want to be late to things, arrival, arriving to say a reading by someone else. I don't want to be the last person to enter the auditorium. I want to be the first person there so I can just sit and calmly think about that person's work who's getting ready to read to us, um, almost have a meditation before they come. I just think it's a gift that no one else tells us could help our lives and we have to claim it for ourselves. I, I remember once reading, reading Ted Hughes was saying in an interview, um, if you're a creative person, a writer, any, any kind of artist, you'll have to claim that time. No one's gonna just come up and, and hand it to you. You know, like, unless you go to a, a writer's sanctuary retreat somewhere where they say, you know, we'll bring you your food and every day is time for you to write in. Well, that's a, that's a beloved luxury that uh, we're lucky to have in this world, places that do that for artists. But um, when we're at home and involved in our own schedules, we sort of have to give ourselves that time. And if we see it as crucial time, not a waste of time, I just think we're given more. Uh, we're given more to think about. And um, that's why I'm probably one of the few people who really likes sitting in an airport waiting for the time when you get on a plane because there's no better time in the whole world to read than just your quiet, anonymous space and people are milling around you, there's movement, there's life, and you have a book and, um, you know, make use of those times that some people seem to resist as, you know, awful times. They're not. What is the term, the Japanese term that you mentioned? I can't remember which poem it's yeah, in. Yeah, it's yutori. Yutori, which means space, life space. And I was told this by a high school age girl, Juna Hewitt, in Japan when I was working in her school. And she said that's why she liked poetry, because poetry gave us a way to kind of stand back for a moment and look at life. A tiny distance, and then when I when I asked her to define you know other contexts for that word, she talked about um, you know just just taking more uh, 
more pause or you know arriving early so you're not rushing um being kind to yourself if you uh you know say one i think one of the examples she gave me was you know we all say we're on a diet and then we go eat a cookie and then we start hating ourselves and she said no if you have yutori you embrace yourself and you said but i love that cookie and it's okay that i ate it right then and now i'll try again she said you just give yourself a little more space to make mistakes um and and then she, you know she and i ended up text communicating about it at greater length than i ended up asking other students and right now one of my one of my dearest friends his name is bill coy and he lives both in california and hawaii he's writing a whole book about yutori because he um was intrigued by this concept so he's been doing research and um looking at other japanese philosophers and thinkers and so keep your eyes open for bill coy c o y um, I should put him in the comments because I think uh, his book should be done soon. And he really feels that it is a principle of life that would help us all in our uh, overly deliberate rushing modern world. I just want to take a moment to remind our live audience that we're going to be getting to as many of your questions as we can. So please go ahead and write those in the comments. And we'll we'll be sharing those with Naomi in a little bit here. Naomi, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about your upbringing. Your your father was uh, was Palestinian American, and you spent you you were born in Ferguson, Missouri, close to St. Louis, and you spent time also in your formative years in Jerusalem. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And uh, my father's family was all still living and still there at that time. And uh, he had a dream, you know, that we would stay there for many years. But after the, the Six Day War in the late 60s, uh, so long ago now, um, we, we left again and, uh, and came to Texas. And, but we traveled back there so many times uh, during our lives while my, my grandmother was still living. She lived to be 106. So that was quite a few travels. And uh, I even had the opportunity to take my own son to meet his great grandmother. And um, he remembers it quite well. He was five, five at the time. So um, yeah, it's, it's remained a part of our lives and it doesn't stay, you know, in the, in the top headlines with all the, the sorrow and tragedy there is in the world, but so much injustice uh, persists there. It is a circumstance of apartheid. No one can say it isn't. If you've been there, if you have any facts on the ground, you know it is. And uh, I keep hoping, as my father hoped his entire lifetime, that uh, Jewish and Arab people there who want to live there, who love it there, would figure out a way that they could truly share everything. But so many things would have to change before that could happen. And it's very complicated. And I know that many uh, larger countries like to uh, manipulate the happenings there. And my father always said that was one of the problems, that if the people on the ground, the Arab people and Jewish people, whom he knew growing up in a very mixed society between the years of 1927 and 1948, when the state of Israel was formed, he said they were all friends, they all mingled. He said, we couldn't even tell each other apart. We shared desserts, we traded, we traded stories, we were pals in the street. Uh, and also all the other people who lived there, Armenians, Greeks, you know, all the religions, the, the different um, philosophical strains of Jerusalem's incredibly deep history. And so for him and for the Palestinians of his generation, that tragedy of suddenly being made second-class citizens, subservient, occupied, uh, having their land and homes taken away from them, uh, and that is still happening every single day. It just doesn't make it into at least U.S. headlines. Maybe Canada is smarter about how the stories are told, but uh, here it's always a backstory, and and it's a very heartbreaking one. And I do know so many fabulous, wonderful Jewish people uh, all around the world who believe, as so many Arab people do, that this situation could be improved upon even during our own lifetimes. I mean, look at our own our own nations that we're living in that have found a way to uh, share 
uh, all the resources and have some kind of mutual uh, equanimity and justice and equilibrium among different cultures. It's a long story, a long process. But uh, one time I was told by uh, a little girl in Calgary in Canada, she was, I think, 12 years old. She wrote me a letter. And to me, this is the only review that counts. She had read my book Habibi in school in Canada. It's a novel for uh, about her age. And she said, I just wanted to write to you and say, I will never look at the Middle East in the same way again. And I will never look at Palestinian people as if they aren't people again. And I just thought that's my job in life. You know, as a writer, one would hope to declare humanity any way you could with every readership you could possibly touch. So I remain forever grateful to my uh, Calgary girlfriend and um, appreciate uh, her reaching out because I think that's, that's part of our job in the service of what poetry wants to do in our lives, extend our borders, connect us, help us see that we're all part of a same human story. You've, this entire book, Voices in the Air, is gorgeous. I have to say, like I, I start when I sat down to read it and I started taking notes. I thought I can, I'm pretty much writing down every single one as one that I want to get Naomi to read out when we do this. But there was a couple that I chose related to uh, Palestine and Israel that I that I hope to get you to share. And one is uh, the first one is called Every Day. And it, it's oh. dedicated to your father in Palestine. It's on page 88. Yes. And uh, also, Ross, I am seeing some uh, some questions coming up. I see that. Yes. You see them too. Yeah. Yes. Oh, well, actually, th right. This is what it's, this says so much better than I could. Um, I, I, I really feel my father in this poem. Um for Aziz in Palestine. He loved the world and what might happen in it. Some people labor to get up, but he was so ready to rise. Refreshed and still alive after the dark hours, glistening with hope and cologne. Must we love the world doubly much now in his absence? He is not absent, still living in the fig tree the carefully placed stone, the draping mimosa, in his empty notebooks, the lonely wooden chair. We will keep it pulled up to the desk, just in case. Just in case, Justice suddenly walks into the room and says, yes, I'm finally here, sorry for the delay. Tell me where to sign. He tried to think the best of people. His drawer was not stacked with disappointments. Only folded white handkerchiefs still waiting. After the storm, frogs and toads chorus along the pavement. We believed, we believed. My dear father, uh, he, was, he was able to have three book signings for his own last book. He was a journalist, but he also wrote some personal books as well. And uh, his own last book was called does the land remember me? A memoir of Palestine. And if anyone out there is is interested, um, it's my job just to tell you about that book since he can't. And uh, he was so proud because his three book signings were sellouts. And we all know in bookstore world, um, dear Banyan books, where I hope to be someday, when you sell out a writer's book, everyone has a feeling of of joy and glee. It's such a precious thing. Um, could I answer the question from Aaron about yes. do you have a religious or spiritual belief? Aaron, I have so many. I was raised in a very ecumenical household. Um, my parents, who neither of whom were practicing their own childhood religions. My father raised in a Muslim family. My mother raised in a Lutheran uh, Christian family. Uh, they were very, very broad minded. And um, uh, they wanted to know other traditions. They were interested in Hinduism, Vedanta, in Buddhism. Uh, I became a religion major in, in college myself. 
And uh, I would say I feel the closest to Zen Buddhism of all spiritual traditions. Um, and I have been very close to the San Francisco Zen Center for many years and the teacher Paul Haller there. Uh, but also I love Jesus. I love Muhammad. I love Sri Ramakrishna in the Vedanta tradition. I love St. Francis. I love, you know, so many saints of different traditions that I love. And according to my parents, you don't have to pick one. And that's what they uh, really tried to embody with their with their open minds. So yes, I am I'm very interested in in uh, spiritual traditions. And um, some other another very kind question from Tina is uh, about um, the significance of the items and pictures behind me in the room I am in. Yeah. Well, yeah, I I would describe myself as a minimalist, but I don't think this room would uh, would demonstrate that because this room, which is a very tiny room actually off my kitchen, it also has my washing machine and dryer over to the side. You can't see them. It's it's my little study, and it's uh, it's a very happy little room where I you know have a lot of books, but certainly not all my books. And uh, this light behind me is a bicycle rim that a friend of mine made. Um, like a constellation. He started a, a, a light making business, an illumination business after running a bicycle business for all of his life, which I thought was a fantastic little transition there. Um, so I just keep, keep things that inspire me. It's a changing gallery. Um, most everything in here would be something I've been given. There's a, there's a print by the great American artist, uh, Ashley Bryan the black and white print behind me. I think you can see that. If you don't know the work of Ashley Bryan, he was someone who inspired both my mother and me all of our lives. Look him up. He just died this very year. He was 98 and he had an astonishing book that came out. Um, his last book was called Infinite Hope, truly a triumph of a book. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's like a little inspiration haven, a little cubbyhole of of objects and probably not to many people's tastes, but um, but I like it and I, I do know where things are in here. You know, I have files, stacks of paper on either side, can't see those. But thank you for the question. Um, many things in here I was given by children also, or um, they came out of workshop experiences and um those are those are the the two questions we've got so far and i encourage everyone to keep sending them in we've got about you know 10 or 12 more minutes here with naomi so if you have any questions don't hesitate please send them in there there's a second poem that i i hoped to get you to share as well naomi sure. um it's on page 94 and it's called double peace yeah Oh, and I, I, I wept when I read this poem. I don't know what it was. It just got oh, me. Thank you, Ross. I appreciate that. And I think the story of the, the poem is, um, you can get it through the poem. But I will say that if any of you out there have ever left a, like a, a conference and forgotten to take off your name badge, where, so you're walking through the streets with your name on your chest, and then you find it later and feel a bit embarrassed. Uh, I had done that, but it gave me this poem because I was recognized by this great voice. For Yehuda Amchai, uh, his family took him to Israel when he was six years old from Poland. And there's a Yiddish proverb at the top of this poem. If I try to be like him, who will be like me? Double peace, not for him and his people alone, but for all who loved that rocky land. Everybody, everybody, sing it. No chosen and unchosen, but everybody chosen. Sing it. All families living under tiled rooftops or flat roofs with strung clotheslines, t-shirts, bed sheets, flags of surrender. I show you my cloth. I live the way you live. All the cousins, second cousins, extra cousins, unknown cousins, no choice, everyone a cousin. Peace better than hurtful moves. Better, better, sing it. 
not rain that fell on a few houses only, not sun that shone on a few favored yards, not air in small containers only for some lungs, double peace multiplied outside, inside every ancient space, every sleek new room with tall windows, peace for sheep and goats grazing in meadows, they already have it. Peace for buckets waiting on doorsteps. Peace in brown eggs lined on counters waiting to be cracked. Peace in skillets and spatulas. We met at a corner, went to his home for breakfast. He said, I would never have taken your father's home. I could never have lived in a stolen Arab home. The great voice of the Jewish people said this to my face, our conversation where streets converged. Um, it meant so much to meet Yehuda Amachai in person. I had been reading his work for years, translated by Hannah Block, a lot of it from California, who was also a very close friend of mine. She and I were often asked to give poetry readings together uh, because people thought we would tell kind of two sides of the story, but as it turned out, we were sort of on the same side of the story, which was justice. And uh, and he was touched. He knew my name through Hannah or reading my poems. I don't know. I can't remember what, but he was touched that I knew his poems as well as I did. And then when he started talking to me about my father's history, I realized, you know, he knows it. He, he, he knows about it. And he gave me a book that day. This was so touching to me a few days later because the book was in Hebrew and he signed it to me, though, in English. And he said, I really want you to have this because it's a book about love. And I do feel that our peoples need to underscore this love together. We need to care about one another, know each other's stories. And I said, I'm completely with you on this. And, you know, I left his home, we hugged, I hugged his wife, we cared. And then I was having a really hard time at the airport in Tel Aviv leaving the country because Palestinian people do. And when they heard that I had been in the West Bank visiting with Arab people, and I said, of course I would be, they're my family. My grandmother is alive, I had to be with her. Um, they were treating me very poorly. This is a common story. Uh, many times they will take your things and keep them. And uh, suddenly one of the security guards grabbed that book from my bag and he ripped it open and said, why do you have this? And I said, well, I had breakfast with uh, Yehuda Amachai a few days ago. And he said, he dated, so he had dated it. That was very helpful. And he said, what do you mean you had breakfast with him? And I said, well, I'm a poet. He's a poet. He saw me on the street. He invited me home. And, and that security guard said, pack her stuff, let her go. She can go. Because somehow carrying a book, I said, I don't read Hebrew, but he was so generous. He wanted me to have the book because it's about the love that we all should be sharing here, not behaving like this. And he said, I hear you, you know, give her her things, she can go. And so I just felt like, you know, poetry does help us out. Uh, many people are curious um, how poetry helps us in our lives. Many people have told me poetry has saved their lives. But at that actual moment, poetry helped me get through it, an airport checkpoint. Wow, that's an incredible story. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we can, we can uh, I see a few more questions have come in here. Yes. Uh, well, we still have some time. Um, just I'm going to this one from I think the name is Marie Marie Bell. I'm sorry for butchering your name, but the question is unrelated to the book of topic, but curious to know what was the inspiration for the poem "So Much Happiness," my fave poem. Thank you so much for the question. Um, it was a love poem to my husband, who is such an optimist. He's a photographer and a wonderful, wonderful human being and such a great listener himself. And uh, it was written so long ago, but I'm happy to say has uh, remained my feeling about this person that he, he carries just so much general uh, 
composure, happiness, hope, always, every day with optimism. Uh, you can never take something horribly negative to him and not have him come back with with a, with a happier suggestion. You know, well, what we can do in this time when we're feeling so grim. Uh, he was challenged, I must say, during the Trump years in the United States because uh, we all had such a hard time with, with everything that we listen to on a daily basis. But um, anyway, it's a love poem. Thank you for the question. And, you know, really looking around and uh, realizing that there is so much to be happy for, even if you don't particularly feel an abundance of happiness yourself on a given day. I also, Ross, see the question about not being ready to share one's work. Yes. Can I read that one out? Yes, please do. Okay. So this is from Terry and it says, what would you say to a young poet who doesn't feel quote unquote ready to share her poetry? Should I keep working at it until I feel ready? Or is this thought that I need to keep getting better first, just a mental self-esteem trap? Should I just get it out of get it out there or wait until I feel more confident? I guess this question touches on the question of confidence as an artist in general. It's a very powerful question. And I think so many people share this question. And I would just say, start small. You don't have to share with, with all sorts of people you haven't met yet. Do you have one friend, one also writing person in your life you might trade work so that it's not just you sharing, but there's a mutual exchange happening where you say, let's make comments on each other's work. Um, let's only do helpful comments and happy comments, hopeful comments. Um, you know, start with, with a little so small circle of people. I, I do think it helps you to share your work in the bigger picture because you gain a strength, uh, yes, a confidence, but also a strength in your own voice, um, having something worthy about it. And please know that doubt is also our, our lifetime buddy, our lifetime friend. It will continue to visit us. That's okay. Um, you never conquer it utterly. It's okay, but just befriend it. Don't let it have too much power over you. And uh, really, I think it's quite touching when people uh, share work that they might feel is a little clumsy or a little not ready yet, because often someone else who reads it might have an insight that would help you. And, and they might see something in it that you're not even aware is there. We often tend to take our own thoughts for granted. And well, of course, you know, that's not very good. Um, I have seen a little boy change between the ages of five and six. Uh, my grandson, having been in school, he's now in his second year of school, first grade. And whereas he used to say, sure, I'll try that to anything. Right now he's saying, oh, I don't think I'd be able to do that. I can't do that. I don't want to do try that. And so I'm trying to get him back just with, let's do something really crazy that neither one of us knows how to do. Uh, back to that gusto of, let's try that. Um, because that, that phobia comes over us very young. Oh, I better not. I probably wouldn't be very good. Um, we're worried about judgment so early. So um, just be kind to yourself and, and letting yourself share, I think will be a gift to you more than it will be scary. Naomi, I think we have time for one more audience question and I'll ask you, do we have time for that as well as one more poem? Yes. So maybe we can, I like, I like Julie's question. I was thinking that might be a nice one to finish on. So I wanted to ask you about this particular poem and who is Connor James Nye? He is my grandson. Uh -huh. I had a feeling. Yeah. And, and I'm listening to him a lot these days. Can you He's... read the poem I vote for you on page 116? Yes. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I think if we have children in our sphere, uh, I also work with a lot of children, um, listening to them can also help restore us to uh, some clearer place, some fresh place. And so this is when he was a little baby. And also it was a time of voting. You smile at everyone. When lifted, toted, you hold tightly to shoulder or sleeve. 
gazing curiously, each room, face, Irish sheep, stuffed puppy, dwelling in a current of care. You know nothing of cruelties people do to one another. You did not see the intricate avenues of Aleppo, tiled ceilings, arching rooms. The villages of Palestine could still be neatly terraced in your brain. When you smile, we might all be wishing each other well. When you startle at a loud sound, await the power of softness to settle you down. There is no other power in your world. Hunger, interest, kicking, joy, carry us there. If your eyes fall heavily closed, sweet rescue in the dozing. What we might remember if we tried much harder. In your dream, no one is a refugee. Everyone has clean sheets. Ross, it's been the greatest pleasure and honor to um, converse with you today. And I appreciate your own poetry and your own blog, as I was telling you, and hope to be one of your listeners in the days coming up. So I hope you'll feel me out there hovering um, at your website and thanking you for uh, the kindness you bring to us. And to Vancouver, to everyone inspired there in all kinds of ways, and to everyone related to Words Vancouver, uh, my deep gratitude. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We've been t speaking to Naomi Shihab Nye a beloved treasure of, of a living poet. And I'm so grateful to have been in conversation with you today. And on behalf of everyone at Word Vancouver and Banyan Books, thank you so much. I just want to remind everyone, if you'd like to purchase a copy of any of Naomi's books or any of the books you hear about at the festival, you can do so at our official bookseller, which is Iron Dog Books. And a big thanks to all the staff and volunteers at Word Vancouver for making this possible. There are a lot more events happening, so check out the complete listing at wordvancouver.ca. Naomi Shihab Nye, thank you, thank you, thank you. My pleasure, Ross. Thanks to Adam and Jacob, too. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani. And I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.